Sally, a new communicable disease investigator at Yersinia Health Department, is conducting her first outbreak investigation. In the last video, her supervisor, Evelyn, provided Sally with important information about public health regulations and other related issues. Sally still has a few questions about the clinical and epidemiology data that must be collected during a public health investigation. She asks Ken, an epidemiologist, for some tips. Hi, Sally. Let's first start out with a definition of epidemiology. It's the study of how disease is distributed in populations and the factors that influence or determine this distribution. The founding father of Epi was Jon Snow. Oops, not the Game of Thrones Jon Snow, this Jon Snow. In the 19th century, during a cholera outbreak in London, Snow went door to door collecting information on cholera deaths and where each house got their water. After analyzing the data, he noticed the clustering around the Broad Street pump. After removing the Broad Street pump handle, the cases subsided. This is a great example of outbreak investigation methods that still apply today. We talk to people, figure out the big W's, who, what, where, when, and take action to try to stop the spread of disease. Just like John Snow did in the 19th century, today, local and state health departments also engage in disease surveillance activities for all reportable communicable diseases. CDC defines surveillance as the ongoing systematic collection, analysis, and interpretation of health data, and then getting that information to the right people. There is passive surveillance where reports come into the health department and active surveillance where the health department goes out and finds cases. Passive surveillance is initiated by a healthcare provider or laboratory when they send a disease report directly to public health without prompting. There are state regulations that require these reports to be submitted. Underreporting can be an issue, but passive surveillance can be useful for large numbers of a common event. Enhanced passive surveillance is similar, but information is sought in a rapid fashion, or in some cases, additional information is requested. This type of surveillance is helpful in outbreak situations when information about a case is needed to guide outbreak investigation and response. This is often referred to as a call for cases. Active surveillance is initiated by the public health community. It is used when information is needed faster than passive surveillance can produce or when additional information not often collected by passive surveillance is needed. Active surveillance is critical for rare events. It requires additional resources and might only be useful for only a short period of time. An example of active surveillance would be a local health department calling local emergency departments every hour for any cases with symptoms associated with chemical exposure. Let's take a look at an example of a foodborne illness outbreak. 10 cases came through to the Yersinia Health Department via CDRSS. We are going to collect data from all the case reports and from the patients themselves. It's very important for us to figure out disease onset and a case definition. Incubation period is the time period from when a person is exposed to a germ, most commonly a bacteria or virus, to when they develop symptoms. This time period varies for each disease. The incubation period for salmonella can vary from 6 to 72 hours. Some diseases have a long incubation period, such as scabies, which can be up to eight weeks. The incubation period is important to know as it can help determine when the exposure occurred and eliminate, remove, or reduce the exposure so others do not become ill. For the salmonella outbreak, we can look back six to 72 hours from each person's symptom onset to estimate when the exposure occurred. Disease onset is the time when the individual begins to feel ill and is often associated with the first symptom of illness, such as fever, diarrhea, or rash. Remember that people can carry a disease without feeling ill. This is called asymptomatic. For certain diseases, even if a person doesn't feel sick, they may still be able to transmit disease to others. For a salmonella infection, disease onset might present as nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, fever, chills, headache, and or blood in the stool. Each disease is different, and you'll need to research the signs for your specific outbreak. You may need to help the person remember the exact timing of symptoms. Showing a calendar may help. 
Infectious period or shedding is a term that refers to the time period when an individual is capable of passing the germ to another person. Again, the infectious period varies by disease. It may be long or short. In each outbreak, we should work to form a clear case definition. It sets criteria to determine if a person is classified as having a disease or not. Outbreak case definitions are used to characterize if individual cases are associated with an outbreak. They typically include a date and place component along with clinical and laboratory information. Using an outbreak case definition ensures standardization, meaning that everyone is being counted the same. It can be different than an individual case definition used for disease surveillance. Let's look at an example of a surveillance case definition versus an outbreak case definition. For our example Salmonella outbreak, we are collecting information from people who ate at Salmonella's restaurant between November 28th and December 4th and are either suspected or confirmed Salmonella cases. Their symptom onset would be somewhere between December 1st and December 7th. It is possible for someone to be sick with an illness and not be counted. Using the Salmonella example, if we set December 1st as the onset date for tracking cases associated with this outbreak and an individual became ill on November 15th, it doesn't mean they weren't ill. It just means they didn't meet our criteria for this outbreak. A line list is a list of people who are ill. Line lists include basic information about the person, such as demographics, symptoms, illness onset, testing, etc., Line lists are often used during outbreaks to gather information about everyone who is sick and determine if they are part of an outbreak. Here is an example of a line list used for salmonella outbreaks. Some health departments just make a sheet in Excel. Take a look at the information that is collected. This is helpful to track all known ill people associated with the investigation. If this is a foodborne outbreak, it's also helpful to include and track what food they ate. An epidemic curve, or epi curve, is a tool that shows the distribution of cases over time and can help determine the incubation period, how the illness is being spread, and the peak of the outbreak. For an epi curve, you will need to collect disease onset. Information needed to create an epi curve is often obtained from the line list. It's a cool visual display of the onset of illness among cases associated with an outbreak. The x-axis, or horizontal, shows the date of illness onset. The y-axis, or vertical, shows the count of cases which occurred on each date. Take a look at the example epi curve of a salmonella outbreak. We use the line list to plot each case by date. See how important each piece of data is to the investigation? Disease onset, incubation period, line list, infectious period, case definition, and epi curves are all part of the epidemiology aspect of the investigation. So Sally, that was a quick Epi 101 lesson. As you investigate more diseases, you will get comfortable with the terms, what they mean, and how they are used during a public health investigation. I'd be happy to walk you through your first outbreak investigation.